Okay, just to make sure my record is accurate here, I don't see Alex or Corso. Everyone else appears to be here. Um, a couple of people were asking me, first reminder that Friday at 3 p.m., we need to have the posters turned in. There is a submission, not turd. There is a submission place on Moodle. If your PDF document is too large to submit on Moodle, then you can get it to me or alternatively to Dr. Crane McNeil um, separately. You know, like if you can email it, you know, email a link on Google Drive, whatever. Um, but we need to have it by 3 p.m. because she'll be taking them to be printed at 3 p.m. Also, next Friday, not this Friday, but next Friday, April 20, is the Nebraska Academy of Sciences field trip. Now, just to make sure we're all clear on this field trip, the field trip, it's $15 that we're paying. So you don't have to pay for the emission or entrance fee. Um, it's at Nebraska Wesleyan University, which is what about four or five miles down 48th Street, and then go right two blocks. Well, four blocks technically, it's on 57th Street. I think. Um, so it's close nearby. Our plan is for students to find their own transportation. We only have a total of 20 people. Well, plus Salvador Miguel City Greenmore, so. Um, 24 County Salvador and his students. So we only have a total of 24 people, I believe, that are going. And so that means, you know, the number of cars that are necessary to transport everyone is pretty small. And historically, it turns out everybody preferred to, to go with a friend and come back with a friend rather than leave at 7.30 in the morning and, and then stay there until noon and come back. I'm going to give you a sheet that has specific things you have to do, like you have to write reports on a few talks. And that could be completed in a little over an hour if you plan your time well. So it's not like you have to be there all day. It does run all day. And so you need to get over there to do some, you know, to go to some meetings and write your reports, but you can you know, only take two hours. So it's not like you have to miss all of your classes and you can choose when you're going to be gone based on your class schedule. We won't be having class in this class, so that's an hour before lunch that's free. Um, so you can take that into account for your planning. Um, I will be driving over and back because I do have class I'm going to have to teach here from 10 to 11, and then I have class I'll have to teach here from noon to 1, and then class again from 2 to 3. So, you know, if if you need a ride, you might talk to me because I'm going to be putting some miles in the car. Okay. Any questions about the poster or Nebraska Academy of Sciences? Obviously, there'll be more about the Nebraska Academy of Sciences coming up. Question, Ashley. I was just wondering, so it, it starts at 8, but then how long is it going to go? Is it um, it goes until 4 p.m. Do I have to be here by 8? Um, no, you do not. Yeah. Now it, it is best if you can be there at least between 9:30 and 10, because I want you to actually interact with the posters. And while there are two poster sessions, most of the people are only there to talk about their posters in the early poster session. And so it works best if you can be there then. And I will give you a schedule with, you know, information later. I haven't received a schedule yet, so I can't give you a schedule yet. Lauren. It is on the website now? Okay. That that is all the talks. Um, no, it, just, it says new numbers. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But I, what I need to see is what the talks are. Because I'm going to say, you know, this talk, this talk, that talk. Okay. I have a lot of slides here that I am just going to pass over. Because these are the slides that formally go with what I talked about on Monday for a lot of it. So I've already talked about these things. I wanted to leave the slides in here so you can come back and look at the slides on OneNote and only hit the highlights. So we're gonna talk about, well, first a bunch of slides on the development of quantum theory and then the quantum numbers as associated with an atom. 
So the cathode ray tube is the earliest thing to change us from the Democritus atom to an understand there's electrons. Cathode ray tube, you have a cathode, an anode. Believe it or not, the cathode is the negative side here. And it was observed that some beam came out of the cathode. And careful observation indicated that that beam was electrons. How did they determine that? By using cross electric and magnetic fields. And with that measurement, they determined the mass to charge ratio for an electron. So E being the charge, M being the mass. They determined the mass to charge ratio. Then Millikan did an experiment where he had little droplets between two charged plates and he measured the rate of the droplets free falling. And then he put electric, uh, a voltage difference, put an electric field there and measured the rate of their motion in electric fields and was able to determine that there were specific charges on the droplets. And so taking the difference in those specific charges, he said that must be one electron, two electron, three electron, four. And so he determined the charge of an electron. Once Millikan determined the charge of an electron, you can go back to this ratio of mass to charge and you then also know the mass of the electron. And so here are the numbers. That should be mass of an electron, not charge of an electron, is 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And the charge of electron is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Remember that charge is actually a negative value for the electron. And so the plum pudding model was Thompson's model that fit his understanding that electrons were in matter. And then we have the Rutherford experiment where they had a thin gold foil and were looking at how alpha particles varied in their path when they went into that gold foil. And here's our first question based on material we talked about, of course, on Monday. What did Rutherford expect would happen when Marsden fired alpha particles as thin gold foil? What was the expectation going into the experiment? We always say that science is, you know, it is unbiased, but you always come into an experiment with an expectation. After all, you, you have a hypothesis and you're testing that hypothesis. You know which way you expect it to be. What did he expect? Still waiting on Brittany and Jeffrey, not just Jeffrey. All right, we have five, two, three, ten. Hey, it actually held it. It's four, two, three, ten. All right, I know it's been two days since I lectured on this. But clearly those are two days where my lecture has been lost to the mist of time. Their understanding at the time that Rutherford did this film experiment was the, the plum pudding model that said that matter was made up of kind of a nebulous positive charge spread everywhere with little plums of electrons, with the electrons far less massive than the positive charge. And so the expectation was these alpha particles would go through, the chances of them hitting an electron would be very, very low. So they'd probably just be going through this very thin layer of positive charge, which might cause them to slow down just an easy bit. But essentially nothing happens. They just slow down a bit. So if you said unaffected, or slow down a very small amount, those are pretty similar. Either one would be close enough, unaffected, slow down a very small amount. Technically, the lowest selected answer 
would be the correct one. Most of them would be slowed down very large or very small amount. If they hit an electron, they might be deviated just a tiny amount. Still virtually no effect. But what they did discover was that most of them bounced at random angles. Well, some of them bounced, not most, but some bounced at, at big angles. And never was this an option that they expected or observed. The alphas were not absorbed at all. I'm, okay, there would be a small, small amount, but very, very unlikely. So what he expected was virtually nothing. But what they found was some of them bounced at really crazy angles, even coming straight back which made no sense. And so scientific method has been a big portion of your laboratory. You do an experiment and that experiment does not confirm your hypothesis. The hypothesis being that matter was, you know, it's positive charge spread out everywhere. So what do you do when you have an experiment that disproves, disproves your hypothesis? <clears throat> You update your hypothesis to something that agrees with this new data. And so the fact that it bounced like straight back meant that it was bouncing off something that was very massive compared to the alpha particles. So Rutherford said there must be a nucleus where we have a high mass. And he was able to actually calculate the size of that nucleus. And he said it's got to be positive charge because it's, it's repelling and so he came up with his planetary model. Planetary model saying you have this small positively charged nucleus with the electrons doing circular orbits around it. Planetary not model seemed really nice, but it had some obvious flaws. Obvi most obvious of those flaws is that electrodynamics would dictate that you couldn't have an electron orbit a nucleus for more than about a billionth of a second before it crashed into the nucleus. Clearly that wasn't the case. So another thing that was a flaw was the emission spectrum. So this is a picture showing what was going on when I had that lamp out here. You have a rarefied gas. It says a thin gas here. And in that gas, you're firing electrons through there. And the gas then gives off light. And that light is not a continuous range of colors. It's only very specific colors, only very specific frequencies of light. And so something in the gas must be responsible for these very specific frequencies. Here's an example showing for different types of gas what those specific frequencies are. Work done by Balmer, he said that you could find a pattern for the wavelengths. That one divided by the wavelength is equal to a constant called the Rydberg constant times one over two squared minus one over n squared, where n is any integer bigger than two. That equation perfectly explained what the wavelengths were for hydrogen gas and I don't have these marked which one is which, so I, I don't have the hydrogen spectrum, but none of these look like hydrogen to me. Um, so I'm not going to mark one. Anyway, that perfectly explained where we have the wavelengths in hydrogen gas. But that suggests that there are some only specific amounts of energy change that you can have for the electrons. And further work, Lyman got the same equation, but replacing two squared with one squared. And that gives you ultraviolet wavelengths, very short wavelengths. And then Poshin said, hey, we can replace that two squared with three squared, and that will get us infrared wavelengths. And then Brackett says we could, not me, we could put in four squared. And Foon said, well, we could put in five squared. And so we have these different series, they all explain and give exact equations for wavelengths that we see in those spectra. 
So here is what the spectra look like, including the Lyman, Balmer, and Poshin series. And so the Balmer series has mostly visible light. Notice the visible light starts about here and ends about here. So the Balmer series is mostly visible. Hence, that's the first one that was observed. The Lyman series is all ultraviolet. The Poshin series is all infrared. Well, we need an atomic model that's going to match that. And so enter, enter the Bohr model. I gave you the four hypotheses for the Bohr model. And I told you when I gave them to you, I may have them in a different order than you'll see later. This is the order from the textbook. So number one, electrons orbit the nucleus in circular orbits. Something that we know today is incorrect. But that was one of Bohr's hypotheses. Number two, the stationary orbits have discrete energies and do not radiate. Number three, the electrons can only change from one stationary orbit to another. And when they do, they're going to give off an energy that's equal to the energy of a single photon. So that that would explain that discrete spectrum of lines. That spectrum of lines comes from electrons falling from one energy level to another energy level. And finally, his quantum hypothesis that angular momentum is quantized. The angular momentum only comes in units of an integer times h bar. So those are his four quantum or his four hypotheses for the Bohr atom. We're not going to do the math on this, but we know that for an electron orbiting a positive nucleus, there's going to be a force between the electron and the nucleus that is due to the charge diff the charges k q1 q2 over r squared now i have here q1 is the charge of the nucleus and that's z times e you might ask why well the nucleus is going to have a number of protons if it's a hydrogen atom z is one so there's one proton if it's a helium atom z is two because there's two protons and so Z is just times the number of protons in the nucleus. And so the force between the electron, which has a charge of E in every case, and the nucleus is ZE, or ZE times E, times K over R squared. So this is the charge of the nucleus and the charge of the electron. Why is there no minus sign in that equation? Charge of an electron is obviously negative because we're taking the direction separately. We're taking the direction separately, so we're just finding the magnitude of the force. Now, remember, Bohr said they're going in circles. So if it's going in circle, I know I said I wouldn't do it, now I'm going to do it. If it's going in a circle, what specific knowledge do you have for circles? A circumference, what'd you say, Ashley? Okay. How about if I have a car that's going in a circle, what can you tell me about that car? It's accelerating. It has to accelerate to go in a circle because acceleration is a change in velocity. So if it's a constant velocity going in a circle, it's going to have to have an acceleration toward the center of v squared over r. And so if I take the sum of the forces toward the center is equal to mass times acceleration toward the center. And then I use this equation. I have an equation now that relates the velocity with the radius. But we had a quantization rule that said L is equal to MVR is equal to NH bar. And so that means that I can replace V is equal to NH bar over MR. 
So I'm going to do that. If I put this in for V, my equation will become KZ E squared over R squared equals M times NH bar over MR quantity squared over R or KZ E squared over R squared equals M N squared H bar squared over M squared R cubed. We're going to multiply everything by R cubed and divide everything by KZ E squared and I will have Now notice I have an M on top and an M squared on bottom. I'm going to cancel one of those. And I'll cancel R squared on the other side. And I have radius is equal to H bar squared over MKZE squared times N squared. I'm going to put a subscript of N for the radius because there's multiple N values possible. We have a specific radius that is going to occur for the electron orbiting the nucleus according to Bohr. So we call that the Bohr radius, and I sure as life hope that I didn't make any mistakes in my derivation there. But you see that wasn't any kind of hard physics. It's the kind of physics that we did a lot in first semester. And so the Bohr model with two things required for this. Number one, circular orbits, because if it wasn't circular orbits, I could not use the accelerations V squared over R. And number two, the quantized angular momentum. Those give me a quantized radius. Once I have that quantized radius, I could put that radius in here and also have a quantized speed. And because of this quantized radius, I can also say my potential energy is minus KQ1Q2 over R. And so I could put in the radius and get my potential energy. And kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So I could put my v in. And all of these things are now quantized. The total energy is the potential energy plus the potential. Yes, potential energy plus kinetic energy. I think I said potential twice. <clears throat> and so you're going to have a quantized total energy. That quantized total energy should be so shown in my slides. So is this the same equation as I have to the right? There's one difference. What's the one difference? There. What's the one difference between the two equations? Um, okay, the, the n is not there because this is r equals 1. So it has a 1 squared here. So that's not the one I'm looking for. Z. I calculated this radius for any number of protons in the nucleus. This is shown for z equals 1. So yay, I did it right. Too happy. So this gives us a general equation, and this equation here, this is exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, so uh, about the cues that you drive this down. Mm -hmm. um, so would that be two Z Zes? The nucleus is Z E, yeah. and the electron is E. Yeah. E. So Z E times E is Z times E squared. But then what about the cues? Q1 and Q2. Q1 was Z times E. And Q2 was E. Yeah. And so oh. Q1 times Q2 is Z times E squared. So that seems to be a great success for the Bohr model. Question? No. Even a greater success is the energies. The energies that are predicted by the Bohr model, I don't have the equation here. I probably have it down below. E sub n is equal to minus 13.6 electron volts over n squared. And you have the z in there, z squared on top, I believe, if you um, have something more than hydrogen. 
That equation predicts exactly the spectra we see for the Lyman series, the Balmer series, the Poshin series, and so on. What we are showing here is the energy levels. So this is N equals one, N equals one here, N equals two, N equals three, and so on, until you get to N equals infinity. One divided by infinity or squared is zero, so that's why it's N is equal to infinity at e equals zero. Those are the different energy states available for hydrogen atoms. And anytime an electron falls from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, it's going to give off a photon. And so each one of those little arrows is showing a possible energy of a photon. And those correspond to the emission lines we see. A grand success. Would you agree? Sure, sure. Thanks. So it's a grand success, but it's not an unmitigated success. This is the last thing on the Bohr model before we talk about the success and failure. It's found that if you take the De Broglie, this guy's name, De Broglie, um, hypothesis that says that we have a wavelength for a particle is equal to Planck's constant divided by its momentum, that if we take the circumference of the circular orbits as determined by Bohr model and the momentum as determined by Bohr model, it turns out that N1 means that we have one wavelength on the circumference. N2 is two wavelengths on the circumference. N3 is three wavelengths on the circumference and so on. And so the De Broglie model actually is in complete agreement with the Bohr model with just taking the De Broglie model and saying that you have an integer number of wavelengths is the circumference of the um, orbit. So successes, three successes I listed. Number one, the Bohr model maintains agreement with the previous ex experiments, that it's mostly empty space with electrons going around it. It predicts the energy levels correctly, which is super important. And it gave a reason electrons don't collapse into the nucleus. Why don't the electrons collapse in the nucleus according to the Bohr model? It's an important point that I pointed out yesterday, or yesterday, Monday. Why should the electrons collapse into the nucleus? I said that today. Not because they're attracted. It, just because they're attracted, because they're moving, they can go around a circle like Newton talked about why the moon doesn't fall into the earth. There's something else. The electrons have a charge. And because they have a charge and they're accelerating, electrodynamics says they have to be emitting radiation. That's energy coming off of them. Remember on Monday I talked about the, the Bremsstrahlung is an example that we had already seen of this. And so classical physics says that you have to have continuous radiation of energy if it's going around a circle. And so it's going to lose energy and spiral in. But Bohr got around that by simply positing, by saying we have only specific energy states possible, and thus it's not allowed to give off a continuous energy stream. It can't just radiate energy because that would require it to have energies that are continuously changing. And so that's how Bohr gets around that one. It's a success, although to me it's an empty success because it just feels wrong to say I made a rule that says it can't happen. Some failures. The Bohr model couldn't explain, and I said this on Monday, couldn't explain why some of the emission lines are stronger and some are weaker. The Bohr model just didn't have an answer for that. And another one, if you zoom in on those emission lines, you find that many of them are split in two. Instead of one emission line, you have two. Where the Bohr models you should, says you should just have one there in the middle. And people are 
Huh. Wonder why. Enter once again, not Sandman, but the actual quantum model. The quantum model, we start by saying we have no idea what path the electrons are taking. We completely throw out the notion that electrons are doing circular orbits. And instead, we're going to simply calculate the probability of finding the electron in a given place. And what we find, remember this picture from last class period, we find a spherically symmetric situation in some cases. But that's not a circular orbit. That's just we're likely to find it in a spherically symmetric region. Without going through the quantum mechanics, we define four quantum numbers to describe an electron in an atom. These four quantum numbers are actually describing the atom, not a specific electron, because who can tell the difference in one electron and another electron in the atom? Nobody can. They're indistinguishable. So we're talking about energy states for the atom, not specific electrons. But n is the first quantum number. n called the principal quantum number. With the Bohr model, n was the only quantum number. And what did n tell us according to Bohr's hypothesis? Not in practice, but according to his hypothesis, what did n tell us? That being his four rules, one of them had n. He gave an equation for one quantized property. Momentum. Angular momentum. N was labeling the angular momentum according to the Bohr model. Not so with the quantum model. Now it turned out with the Bohr model, N labeled everything. N told you the radius, it told you the energy, it told you the angular momentum. In the quantum model, N is called the principal quantum number, and it primarily tells you the energy. It's not the only piece of energy, but it's the one that primarily tells you the energy. And the quantum model gives you the same equation for energy as the Bohr model did. Well, that's great. That means one of the successes of the Bohr model is replicated in the quantum model. Let's move on. L is a new quantum number that tells us the orbital angular momentum. Orbital angular momentum means it's going around in some fashion and it has an angular momentum. Now it's possible for it to have an angular momentum of zero. The simplest way to have an angular momentum of zero is to be stationary. Another thing you could do and have zero angular momentum would be to move directly toward the center and out from the center. If you're moving only radially, you have no angular momentum. Beyond that, you know, if you have something that's doing, let's say, a figure eight pattern. A figure eight pattern, we have change in angular momentum through the pattern, probably. So what do we know about the paths? Nothing. All we know is that we have a state with zero angular momentum. And the total angular momentum is given by this funny equation, L times L plus 1, all square rooted, times h bar. And L, the total angle, the angular momentum quantum number can be anywhere from 0 up to 1 minus n. So if n is equal to 3, what values can L have? I, I, I know you answered, but I couldn't hear you, Brittany. Not negative. L has to be positive. Okay, it could be 2, 1, or 0. Those are the only three options. The number of L options is equal to N because it's going from N minus 1 down to 0. So if N is equal to 5, it could be 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. But that's not all. The next one is the magnetic quantum number. Whoops. Orbital magnetic quantum number. The orbital magnetic quantum number, m sub l, is telling you about the angular momentum. But l, the l, um, the angular momentum quantum number, it tells you what the total angular momentum is. m sub l tells you how much angular momentum you have 
in the direction of an applied magnetic field. Now, if you think about that for a second, it seems really silly. If I put it in no magnetic field, M sub L then has no meaning. When I put it in a magnetic field, then M sub L has meaning. And it's telling me the component of the angle momentum parallel to my magnetic field is M sub L multiplied by H bar. Now that leads to some interesting geometry, which I think I have a picture. I don't have a picture for it. Uh, well, did I draw this picture yesterday? See, I'm doing the same stuff in my quantum mechanics class right now. I'm talking about electron spins in the class period after this. So if I did, stop me. This is supposed to be a circle with radius equal to L. Well, a semicircle, a half circle. Now, we have from our equations that L is equal to H bar times the square root of lowercase L times L plus 1. So let's take the, an example of L equals 2. That's a number 2. Then the total angular momentum is equal to H bar times the square root of 2 times 3. 2 times 3 is 6. Root 6. So that would be... So this value here is, of course, minus h bar root 6. And this one up here is plus h bar root 6. Now the m sub l's tell us how much is in the z direction. So if this is my z direction, l sub z is equal to m sub l h bar. The m sub l values have to have m, they're, they're integers. And so if I look at this, I could have m sub l is equal to 0. And what that means is the component of angular momentum that's in the z direction is zero, which means the orientation of my angular momentum is perpendicular to my external magnetic field. Or I could have, okay, my, my, my picture's not so good. That's, here, m sub l equals one. And so this is going to be h bar. Here, m sub l equals 2. So this is 2 h bar. Now, if m sub l is 3, I would, of course, have 3 h bar for the compound in the z direction. But that would be up here. Square root of 6 is bigger than 2 squared, but smaller than 3 squared. Or, excuse me. Square root of... 6 is bigger than 2 but less than 3. So that means it's not possible for me to have an m sub l value that's bigger than 2 here because that would give me the component of my angular momentum in the z direction is bigger than my total angular momentum. That would be kind of like saying I am 6 foot 2 and a half inches tall but the amount that I stretch in this direction is 7 feet. Well, no. It's not going to be more than my height. And so that sets a practical limit that m sub l cannot exceed l. Because this was for l equals 2, m sub l can't exceed 2. And likewise, m sub l can't exceed minus 2 on the negative side. So m sub l has to be between minus l and plus l. So it's integers between minus l and plus l. So if l is 2, that gives me 0 plus 2 on the top side and 2 on the bottom side. So I have 2L plus 1 possible values for M sub L. So 2L plus 1 possible values for M sub L. And it was N possible values for L. So we have limits on our quantum numbers that they, they come through math or like this one here, you can show them from the meanings. That's three quantum numbers. How many did I say we need? Four. We need four quantum numbers. The fourth one 
has to do with spin. <laughs> when I was going through my slides from last year, I saw that I had a mistake on this one that was kind of funny, but we won't go through it. Spin is a really interesting beast. I should, yeah, I don't have it here. I should shift to my quantum physics lecture because I have more on the spin. That's my lecture topic. I've told you this before, but it probably is not something that's stuck. What is spin of an electron measuring? It's what? Not sure. Spin? It's what? It has some sort of magnetic axis. It has some kind of magnetic axis to the lines. Go back to that. Remember when I showed that there was a problem with that fine structure that what should have been one line according to the Bohr model was two? Well, when they observed that, they said, well, what would cause it? It could be, it could be, that we have an angle momentum for our orbital, for the electron going around, and because the electron has a charge, there's a magnetic moment associated, just like if I have wire current going through a wire loop, right? Just like they have back there. So the electron orbiting is making the magnetic field, and the electron, maybe the electron, also has a little magnetic field. And so the electron's gonna be a lower energy state if it's aligned with the magnetic field of its orbit. And it's going to be a higher energy state if it's anti-aligned. And so I said, what would make the electron have a magnetic moment? It must be spinning. Because if I'm a charged object and I spin around like this, I'm gonna behave like a magnet now. I'm gonna make a magnetic field. They were wrong. Electrons don't spin. As far as we know, the spin is incorrect. It was an idea that they came up with. It turns out that it would be impossible for an electron to spin fast enough to create its magnetic moment. Not physically possible, hence not the right answer. So the answer scientists have come up with is that the electron has an intrinsic magnetic moment. The electron behaves like a little bar magnet all on its own. Just something that God put in there. And in careful measurements of spin, of angular momentum, we treat the, the electron still as if it's angular momentum. And so we use the same ideas, even though it's intrinsic property. But if you go through the math, which I have just done in my quantum physics class, you find that it's possible to have total angular momentum values, L values, that are either all integers or all one-half integers. That is, you can have 0, 1, 2, 3. That's what we have for the atom that we've done. Or you could have one-half, three-halves, five-halves. And what scientists have found is that the electron's intrinsic magnetic moment behaves like it has an angular momentum of one-half. It can never be any other value but one half. So what's the spin of an electron? Always one half. So S is a quantum number that we never talk about because S is one half. S is the spin, yes. Does this one half be negative like depending on the direction of the... No, that's the orientation. That's the magnetic number for spin. Remember we had L for the angular momentum quantum number? And we had M sub L for the magnet, the orbital magnetic quantum number. So we have S is one half for the spin quantum number, spin angular momentum, even though it's not quantum number. And then we have M sub S for the orientation for the magnetic. And the M sub S can be one half or minus one half. So you were thinking the right thing. It's just it's a different quantum number. That's the one we talk about, the one that can have two values. So the spin can be either one half or minus one half. So the total intrinsic angular momentum, which doesn't really exist because it's not really spinning, is always going to be h bar times three quarters, the same equation as you had for total angular momentum. And then the component in the z direction is, as we just finished saying, either plus one half or minus one half. What we usually in chemistry cl class simply call spin up and spin down. So that's our fourth quantum number.
So you can have two values for M sub S. Ah, these four quantum numbers. You guys all know the poly exclusion principle. The poly exclusion principle is a rule that applies to any particle that has one half integer spins. What has a one half integer spin? An electron, also a proton, also a neutron. All of these things have one half integer spin, so they all must obey the poly exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle actually comes from calculation of your wave function. In calculating the wave function, you find that if you have two particles and they're both fermions, that is particles, fermions, named for Enrico Fermi, if they're particles with one half integer spin, you have two fermions that have exactly the same quantum numbers, your wave function is zero. We say it collapses. That means it cannot exist. You cannot have two indistinguishable particles, like two electrons in an atom, that have exactly the same set of quantum numbers. Now this used to confuse me, because if I have two hydrogen atoms, can one hydrogen atom be in the n equals one, l equals zero, m sub l equals zero, m sub s equals one half, and the other one have exactly the same set of quantum numbers? If they're two separate hydrogen atoms, The answer is yes. I can have two separate hydrogen atoms, both in the ground state, both in the same identical state, because the electrons are differentiable. This one belongs to this hydrogen atom, this one belongs to this hydrogen atom. Now, if the two hydrogen atoms are bonded together, then I won't be able to have that, because then I won't be able to distinguish the electrons. So it's only if they're indistinguishable electrons do we have the Pauli exclusion principle. So Pauli exclusion principle, you cannot have any two electrons that are indistinguishable, i.e. any two electrons in the same atom with the same quantum number. Simple, simple question. How many quantum numbers are required to specify the state of a hydrogen atom? Okay, everybody's answered. Thankfully, the answers have been shifting toward right. There were a lot of people who answered wrong, which scared me. There's still a lot of people that answered wrong, but at least a simple majority is right this time. I've said like five times, you have to have these four quantum numbers. Those four quantum numbers, the principal quantum number primarily tells you the energy, the Angular momentum quantum number or orbital angular momentum quantum number tells you the angular momentum of the orbit. The magnetic orbital quantum number tells you the orientation of the angular momentum. And then the spin magnetic quantum number tells you the orientation of the spin magnetic moment, if you will. So you have to have those four. So here's a summary of the quantum numbers. Orbital magnetic, spin magnetic, the bottom two, orbital in principle, and the values they can have. Now, if we talk about identifying electrons in an atom, we like to use some abbreviations in spectroscopic notation. In spectroscopic notation, you see that 2p3. That 2 tells us the n value. So when you have a number preceding spdf, it's telling you the n value, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Then the p symbol is a symbol that tells us our l value, our angular momentum quantum number. S, um, oh man, I just I went through this two days ago. I can't remember what S is. Um, p is principal, D is diffuse, 
SP be um, F is I think it's fine. Um, and S I swear has to do with being small, but you know a, a single line. But those stand for words S P D F. After F, you just go in alphabetical order, but omit J. So it goes S P D F G H I K L M N. So those are telling you the L value. S is equal to L is zero. P is L is one, D is L is two, and so on. So when you see P, that just tells you, ah, so L is one. And then the superscript is how many electrons are in that shell. So here's S, P, D, F, G, H, how many electrons you can fit in each. And here, I looked at it before class to make sure it showed up nicely. The table is completely missing. Well, I guess I'll stop here because the periodic table is missing. And, oh, wait, there's the periodic table. It just moved. So if you look something like ruthenium, it tells us ruthenium is the electron structure of a krypton atom plus an N equals 4, D, remember SPD, so D means L equals 2, with 7 electrons in it and then a 5s with one electron in it. We have to stop here, so I will pick up with that next class period.